And uh, thank you for Symbios for inviting me to speak to you this afternoon. Again, welcome to Cardiff. Um, I guess my talk is going to focus on how a pediatric orthopedic surgeon who does young adult hip can make his life very difficult and those of other arthroplasty surgeons very difficult as well. So I want to give you some insight into the current procedures that might be done and some of the difficulties you'll face with these uh, children who've uh, had previous surgery. So as Alan says, I've been uh, here for quite a while, probably long enough now to see some of the babies I operated on when I first practiced coming into my young adult hip clinic. So since 2001, so 17 years this year. And I deal with a fairly broad spectrum of disease, but the common ones, DDH, Perthes, and Sufi, as well as having a hip arthroscopy practice and an arthroplasty practice. So what are the general principles for us as uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeons to follow in relation to surgery and in trying to make things uh, easier for the arthroplasty surgeons? Well, I think firstly, it's really important to know the natural history of the disease you're dealing with. Um, so if you look at the literature um, and you rely on some of the older papers, uh, a chap who I've got a lot of respect for in Stuart Weinstein produced a lot of literature on natural history of hip disorders as well as scoliosis. And I think that the population of Iowa are fairly unique because my patients in South Wales complain a lot more than those patients seem to in terms of when they get to their uh, early teens and early adulthood. So I think that DDH, Sufi and Perthes don't do that well and actually the majority end up with hip problems at a fairly young age. So it's important to know that. It's important to plan any surgery you do on a child, um, thinking of what might happen in terms of um, the adult situation. So when you're planning osteotomies, looking at offset, looking at displacement of your fragments, and making sure that you're not making things extremely difficult later on. For me, it's really important to remove metalwork, and that can be quite difficult because you may have performed a fairly big operation on a child. They may be doing well, and then you have to convince them to come back, convince the parents that they need more time off school to come back and do another procedure. But I think knowing that I'm going to be pro probably operating on them again, uh, perhaps I'm more prone than other pediatric orthopedic surgeons to make sure I do take that step and remove the metalwork, leaving um, things easier for later on in life. And I guess if you talk to most of you as arthroplasty surgeons, one of the main important things is to maintain hip abductors. Uh, most revision surgeons can do something as long as you've got good abductors and further surgery is usually possible. So I'm going to talk a little bit about DDH. Uh, I'm conscious there's a talk a bit later as well, uh, doing the same thing. Perthes, Sufi, and some, uh, some sort of difficult um, banana type skin patients. So if we start off with DDH, um, unfortunately this x-ray is not an uncommon thing to see in my clinic. Um, we're still unfortunately in this country not screening properly for DDH and as a consequence we still see 10 to 15 cases in a tertiary center turning up with a late dislocation. Some of you will recognize this chap. This is Professor Reinhard Graf, who pioneered ultrasound screening for, for neonates. And uh, he comes to this country once a year, has been doing so for about 25 years now, initially teaching the hip ultrasound course in Dorset. More recently, we've moved that course to Cardiff. I've been fortunate to know him for, for quite some time. And he really views the UK as his missionary outpost, in that we're still the only country one of the only countries in Europe who isn't screening all our babies for DDH. It's a simple test and I really wish that we could get an universal screening program. And I'm working with colleagues quite hard with the Welsh Government to try and push that forward. So, um, and back in Austria and Germany, you know, Salter osteotomies are virtually non-existent. They, there aren't many surgeons that know how to do them because they don't get late DDH. They pick it up early, they treat with a, with a harness or a, or a hip spiker, and they produce pretty normal hips by the time the child is about three to six months of age. But unfortunately, um, in this country, when you have a late dislocation, then you usually have to perform an open reduction, 
You may also need to do an acetabuloplasty. And you can certainly improve the anatomy, but I can never make the hip normal. And I think that's a very important point to make to parents, that you cannot reproduce a normal hip when you have a hip that's been lying outside the hip socket for about a year or so, uh, which has an abnormal shape. And your surgery will always produce a degree of avascular necrosis. It just depends how honest you are. Because if you look at the slide here on, the, on, the, on this hip here, you can see that there's a degree of coxa magna. So whenever you open a child's hip capsule, you will get a degree of coxa magna. And I can always tell a child that's had an open reduction. Your acetabulum will remodel, it will improve. The acetabular index will get better. But as in this particular child, 12 years on, this is a CT scan, the child's now 14, has come to see me recently complaining of some labral type symptoms. And you can see the CT scan still shows significant femoral uh, antiversion and a degree of um, focal dysplasia anteriorly. So I can't re-emphasize enough, you can't, as a pediatric surgeon, make a missed DDH hip normal. Uh, unfortunately, we sometimes see children presenting much later, two and a half, three years of age. And it's incredible how no one's ever picked this up, but it happens. Um, so this was a child who's three, uh, came in with an with a, a initial x-ray, because I think one of, the, one of the family had noticed that uh, they'd been limping since they'd been walking about a year earlier. And in this situation, you really have to do a lot of surgery. So the literature would suggest that over the age of two, you need to do a femoral shortening to decrease the incidence of avascular necrosis. You need to do an open reduction and combine it with some form of pelvic procedure. So a lot of surgery. So this is the child um, intraoperatively with a salt osteotomy. You can see the femoral shortening from the plate. This is the child just after coming out of spica. You can see I've taken the salt wires out at about six weeks. It's too early to take the femoral plate out. And this is the child a year or so later, just prior to plate removal. But you can see the femoral head proximally has significant abnormalities in terms of its morphology. So this is probably the simplest um, condition to treat. And this is where you just have dysplasia without a dislocation. So these are things now we're able to pick up with ultrasound as a sort of a type 2B hip and treat really quickly. But uh, if it's not been done in that case, you will get residual acetabular dysplasia. I would normally leave the child to see if nature would improve that up until about the age of four. And the literature would show that if he doesn't get better by the age of four, it doesn't tend to get better. So you have to take your opportunity at that point to, to perform an osteotomy of your choice. I tend to perform a salter osteotomy. And that will give you a relatively normal looking hip uh, a year or two later, because you haven't had to open the hip capsule and hopefully you've had no avascular necrosis. So the challenges with DDH are numerous. And if you look at the acetabular issues, then you have lack of bone stock and coverage of the cup for your arthroplasty. On the femoral side, you usually have a high neck shaft angle, as we've heard. You'll have increased femoral antiversion virtually always. You will also have femoral canal stenosis and a, very mu a, a significant mismatch between the AP diameter and the medial to lateral diameter. Hence, perhaps the need for a custom type stem or a conus type stem. So Crow's classification will, will help us uh, perhaps uh, determine what type of procedure we're going to uh, need to undertake with, with hip replacement in these patients. Uh, the Crow's 1 and 2's probably aren't a big issue, but the 3 and 4 are a major challenge. So you end up with a young adult that has hips looking something like this. And you know I've seen various x-rays in, in meetings where these have been left. And uh, at the age of 80, the patient's still walking. So you could argue that you shouldn't be doing anything. But if they are in pain, then you are obliged to do something. So you might need to perform fairly significant surgery, either using custom implants, usually with a subtrochanteric osteotomy. So that's all I'm going to say about DDH, because I know there's some more to come later on. So let's move on to the enigma, which is Perthes disease. So this really is 
a major problem, a fairly catastrophic thing to have as a four to eight year old in terms of the avascular necrosis is significant. Uh, you end up with a hip despite whatever we think we can achieve, an abnormal hip. Uh, and there are major challenges later on to arthroplasty. So you have a, a, a femoral head that's flat and wide. You have a short neck with excessive antiversion. And as a consequence of that abnormality, your acetabulum becomes abnormal as well. So your acetabulum will be retroverted with a narrow AP diameter. Um, and it's difficult sometimes just using traditional reamers not to damage the anterior and posterior walls. You'll also have a significantly short leg, depending on whether there's any surgery been performed or whether the condition has just been left to take its course. Again, if you look at the literature, there is evidence to say that you can use a monoblock type cementless stem for perthes. Um, so this is uh, one of my patients. So you can use just a, a standard cementless system. But there are other papers which show that you might get a better result with a custom stem because you are, as we've heard already, trying to promote optimization of the metaphyseal bone contact in the proximal femur. So this might be your first presentation. Um, a child has come in with a painful limp, age four or five. You've got the first stages here of Perthes with femoral head sclerosis. What do you do? Well, no one can really agree in the world of pediatric orthopedics what the best thing to do with Perthes. Everyone agrees that the results aren't generally very good. So um, credit has to go to Dan Perry, who works in Alderhey, Liverpool, who set up this study, which has just finished recruiting for Perthes and for Sufi in this country, because there are a huge uh, number of small uh, publications with small numbers um, showing, you know, various osteotomy might be better than an osteotomy versus physiotherapy. So we really don't know what's best. And hopefully this study will help us a little bit to determine what might be best for these children. So uh, in my hands um, and in our department, we fully um, accept that the older female child generally does badly with Perthes disease. So we have a cutoff of the age of seven where we would um, decide to operate on the child to try and contain the hip. So the treatment principle is all about containment. Um, and I've uh, adopted the work of ben Benjamin Joseph, who probably has the highest series of Perthes in the world, works in southern India, who promoted the concept of a lateral open wedge varus osteotomy to contain the hip when you know the hip is going to do badly, in other words, the older child. If you wait for the fragmentation phase, unfortunately, you're too late. You have to still have a round head to put in that round socket to uh, enable it to remodel. Now that creates problems for later on because you are, despite the lateral open wedge, minimizing your shortening, you are still changing the biomechanics of the hip. At the same time, I perform a trochanteric epiphysiodesis to try and stop the high riding trochanter. And you end up with something like that. And you might say, well, it looks reasonably congruent. The head is still big. You still got a coxa magna. You can see the acetabulum has already started to remodel to accept the bigger head. But you've got some altered geometry down here in the proximal femur. And that's what it looks like uh, about four years out. So I'm under no illusions that although the hip is functioning reasonably well at the moment, uh, by, the, by the time this, um, this child's a young adult, there will be some problems. And I think in the, the current uh, demanding society that we deal with, most people just won't put up with hips that are painful in their 20s. They want to get on with life and they don't accept that nothing can be done until they're in their 50s or 60s. So acetabular retroversion uh, has been shown to occur as a consequence of the Perthes disease. Um, but actually I can show you um, a procedure that we as pediatric orthopedic surgeons do, which makes that potentially worse. So I did my fellowship uh, at the Sick Kids in in Canada, where Salter was still walking about in the corridors and still had a, a big influence on the unit. And I came away from that fellowship with, I think, the misconception that the Salter osteotomy was the panacea to all hip problems. And it really was done for virtually everything there. 
And so when I came back um, as, a, as a sort of a young surgeon, I decided that if I did have a significant problem with Perthes and that I wasn't able to contain the hip with simple conservative methods, that I should do a Salter osteotomy on it. And this is one such patient. You can see the hallmarks of the heel Salter osteotomy here. And you can see the head it doesn't look too bad, but this child can only flex to 90 degrees, uh, or a young adult, sort of 15 year old at this stage. So, in fact, what I'd done by performing a Salter osteotomy was I hadn't really um, produced enough lateral cover. You can see the hip is still uncovered laterally, but I had produced too much anterior cover, and therefore, sort of almost created a pincer impingement. So, this is where sort of uh, Gantz first discovered. FAI was he looked at some of the um, uh, PAOs that he'd done and realized that some had been overcovered, causing himself a pincer impingement. So I soon realized that Salter osteotomy was not a great operation for Perthes. So as you can see, it hinges on the, um, uh, on the pubic symphysis. It's an operation you can do when the triradiate is fused, so it has certain appeals. But if you overdo the anterior cover, you'll end up with problems. So in this particular child, I had to get better flexion in the hip because he couldn't sit properly. So I ended up having a surgical dislocation and, um, and, and sort of changing some of the offset, almost doing a chylectomy. And what this taught me was that if you look at the cartilage inside a Perthes hip, then there's no, um, there's no doubt that it's very abnormal. It's fissured. Even your, your X-ray and your MRI might look pretty normal. When you look at that cartilage, it's very unhealthy. And so I don't really do very many big open procedures on Perthes um, at the moment. We just tend to do the lateral open wedge osteotomy early on in the fragmentation phase. So this is the, this child who's now 17, still has some discomfort, and I have no doubt will eventually have problems with this hip. So moving on to uh, Sufi, which obviously affects the older child. Again, if you read uh, Stuart Weinstein's paper, you will be under the impression that if you pin this in situ, the kids all do really well, and they have a fantastic pain-free adult life. Absolutely not true. <coughs> so not only are these severe slips extremely difficult to pin in situ, technically, because getting that screw uh, on the lateral view not to come out of the inferior femoral neck can be a challenge. You haven't actually addressed any of the biomechanical problems here. So these kids are usually two centimeters short. They are markedly externally rotated, and they walk on their tiptoe into your clinic like this. So pinning in situ uh, is a fairly poor operation for the severe slip. But it's the operation that most pediatric orthopedic surgeons will do because it's safe. And it's, uh, you know, it's going to reduce the pain in the short term by getting an early fusion. But you're going to be still left with a problematic hip later on down the track. So this is a 15-year-old um, tennis player, quite, quite a highly rated tennis player um, in Wales. That's not saying much. There aren't that many tennis. <laughs> there aren't that many good tennis players in Wales. But he, he certainly and his family rated him highly. <laughs> and he was having a lot of problems uh, getting down to the net to, uh, to feel the drop shot. And he, he went along to a chiropractor initially who diagnosed that he had a problem with his, with his back. And he ended up going to see the spinal surgeons and he had a spondylolisthesis. <coughs> and then they noticed that his hips didn't move very, very well. And they took an x-ray, which showed that he had a stable, chronic, severe slip on the right side. On the left side, also a moderate slip. So I'd just been to sort of learn um, how to do a, a Gantz surgical dislocation. And um, I'd uh, um, seen Michael uh, Lunig, who's been mentioned earlier on, perform his epiphyseal realignment procedure. And I'd also been down to see Darren Fern down in Cornwall, who did quite a lot of these. So I convinced him to come and give me a hand with this uh, the young man. So he came down to Cardiff, and we did it together the next day. And you know, you can get a really good result from realigning these epiphyses. On the other side, you know, obviously, you wouldn't do a realignment there. You just put a, a screw into that, because it's only a mild to moderate slip. 
But this is really quite challenging surgery. And in my hands, having done about 20 of these, I have a 20% avascular necrosis rate. And the literature quotes uh, from Cattrall's paper up to 30%. And uh, Gantz reports a 0%. Now, you can um, believe that if you will. I find it difficult to believe a 0%. But uh, it's a big operation to do. But if it works, it really gives back a normal hip with a normal offset. And this, this young lad was pretty, ha pretty happy and got back to his tennis. And that's him a couple of years later. And now his problematic hip is the other side, where he's still got reduced femoral head to neck offset. This was a, an 18 year old who presented to the clinic having had a um, event of a painful hip when he was uh, a teenager but clearly he'd had a missed, slipped up a femoral epiphysis, which no one had picked up on. And he was in a fair bit of trouble with a short leg, fixed in external rotation, and you can already see that he had some reduced joint space here. Now, the old papers will tell you this is remodeling, okay? So even in Weinstein's paper, he will say, oh, you see how the femoral neck remodels. Well, that's not remodeling, that's just that, hitting up against the edge of the acetabulum. So this is just a sign of impingement. And if you do nothing for this, this articular cartilage and labrum will disappear in a matter of uh, a few years. So um, prior to doing epiphyseal uh, realignment surgery, probably a safer option in terms of risk of avascular necrosis is to do a valgus flexion osteotomy. So I did a fair few of these when, uh, when I was younger as well. Uh, these are also challenging procedures to get the flexion is particularly important to restore the offset. Uh, this, this guy, you can see almost uh, his femoral, his sort of space has perhaps even got a bit better since that last x-ray. Uh, and this is about 15 years down the line. He's got lost to follow up, so hence I haven't taken his metal work out. However, um, if you do this procedure, um, you can see here where the, uh, where the screw <coughs> used to be, uh, that channel of bone there then you really have to build in enough flexion to get their biomechanics back. And in this case, I don't think I did get enough flexion, and he's still left with a, a degree of impingement anteriorly. So he went on to have a surgical dislocation and a restoration of his uh, femoral head neck offset. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some, some miscellaneous problems. Um, so this first one is, a, is an eight-year-old with um, hypopituitarism, um, so uh, short stature and some fairly abnormal bone morpho morphologies you can see, a very high neck shaft angle and uh, just had a simple fall and sustained a fracture across the femoral neck. It was fairly undisplaced as you can see on the, uh, the lateral view but unfortunately uh, even with simple treatment of a hip spiker went on to develop avascular necrosis within um, six to nine months of having this injury. So you can see now that you've got a head that's sort of collapsing in front of you. So what to do at this point? Well, didn't feel we could leave it. So initially I tried my, uh, my lateral open wedge osteotomy to see if I could tip that in. But you can see it's still not tipped in quite enough. So uh, another procedure which we perform from time to time is, is a shelf procedure. So I do a shelf by basically doing a trap door, bringing a flap of, uh, of bone down, filling it in with either bone graft or in this case, some calcium triphosphate to try and get better cover. Um, but you can see this hip is still abnormal. We've created a bit of deformity down in the proximal femur and there will be a challenge later on when I'm sure this, this uh, young girl does come to need further surgery. This was an interesting case I came across fairly early on in my career as a consultant. It was an eight-year-old child who'd been having uh, hip pain for about six to eight months. And rather unusually, she'd sustained a vertical stress fracture, which you can see here on the, on the right hip. So her leg was short, uh, the femoral neck had shortened significantly, and she was still in pain. Now, you might think, well, put some screws across it and that should heal. But you, very, you have very little uh, bone to play with before you hit her physis, and you don't want to damage the physis. So in this case, um, I did a valgus osteotomy, which got the 
uh, bone to heal very well. But again, we've created an abnormality in her biomechanics with quite a high riding, high riding trochanter and perhaps a, a slightly higher neck shaft angle than on the other side. So again, a deformity which you will take into adult life. Probably some of the most depressing cases I treat are severe avascular necrosis. And I probably have up to about 15, 20 cases uh, from my own practice and practice elsewhere of severe slips um, and other uh, bad injuries where the hip ends up looking like this hip on the left hand side. So this uh, is actually a 15 year old girl uh, who's obviously in a lot of pain, discomfort, and you know you have to do something. So I try and wait until the child's at least fully grown so we can address leg length discrepancy. Um, but it's really difficult. And I try and get them to 16 because that means I can do the arthroplasty in, in the arthroplasty unit as opposed to the children's hospital. And I can tell you it's a lot of fun and games to do arthroplasty in the children's hospital. They're actually in different sites in Cardiff, so if you need some different implant, it's a long, long wait to get it. So apologies to Professor for my 1D uh, plan, but what I would normally do is, is see if I can if I can use a, um, a standard monoblock cementer stem, and you know, most of the time, I think, as we've already heard, I get away with it, and it's possible. But whether the biomechanics are perfect in terms of um, avoiding edge loading, etc., I think we've had a, a fairly inspiring talk about that already this morning. It may not be the case. And I'm sure there is uh, more of a role for custom type implants in these difficult deformities. So um, I'm going to just uh, finish off with another case which presented to my clinic about two or three years ago. So this is a young man who's uh, I think about 24 years of age with spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, has got a lot of pain in his left hip and you can see there's it almost looks like a Perthes type hip with large uh, cysts in the femoral head. Um, so did the usual thing, you try and put these things off, don't you? You inject them for a while with steroid and send them away and they always come back. And they say, can I have another injection? And the time span between the injection gets less. And eventually you've got to sort of grasp the nettle and do something about it. So um, this was my first experience with uh, Symbios. So I um, got the plan done. I won't go through all the whole plan, but this was basically what the plan was telling me from an acetabular viewpoint. And we know that the, uh, the acetabulum is absolutely key in terms of placing that to, to then rely on your femoral stem. Uh, so the femoral stem, there was a degree of uh, heli torsion in this stem. And so it did require a degree of um, retroversion of the, of the neck in order to get the center of rotation as planned. Uh, this was my first case, so I, I, it's always a good idea to do a fir your first case with a colleague. So myself and Alan John did this together. We felt that we put the acetabulum in the correct position. We were doing it through a standard posterior approach. But what we found when we put the, uh, the rasp in and trialed was that actually it was very unstable um, posteriorly. So there wasn't, wasn't enough posterior cover. Um, and whatever we did, we couldn't really get this hip as stable as we would want. So thankfully, there was a, a, a modular stem option available. And I'm not a big fan of modular stems and necks, but in this case, it did help us out. And we had to put a 15-degree antiverted neck on to get this head stable. Um, so after that, I was a little bit put off. Um, by the custom stem experience. So I decided that we really needed to see why that had happened. And uh, Justin and his team were very helpful in getting some analysis done for this patient. Um, so it panned out that we had put the cup in the correct position. So you can see the post-op is in red and the, uh, the blue is the, is the planned. So the cup was adequately antiverted. But, but I think what we had done which wasn't really um, easy to appreciate at the time, was that the stem was put in relative retroversion compared to the plan. And that combined with the, uh, the Healy torsion uh, meant that there was uh, 
uh, not enough cover posteriorly. So this chap did pretty well from his left side, but then of course we've, we've made him about two centimeters or three centimeters longer on the one side, and he needs to have his other side done, which is also painful. So on the second side, um, you can modify these plans and, and the company will always come to you and discuss the plan with you. With the previous experience, I decided that we probably needed a little bit less <coughs> heli torsion on this side, so reduced it from 21 to 16 degrees, um, and then went ahead with the second side. And you know, the second side really worked perfectly uh, and gave us uh, excellent stability, and uh, you know, the young man was very happy afterwards. So the lesson for me was, um, I think you have to look at the plan, you have to decide whether you're happy with the, the degree of um, retroversion that's suggested, and you've got to put the stem in exactly the right position, otherwise things don't pan out. Uh, and that comes down to the reamer as well, which Callum's already mentioned. You have to have confidence in getting that reamer down to the level that you meant to. So, in summary, I think we all accept that childhood hip problems generally will result in some degree of hip disease as an adult. So if you look at the NJR, um, it quotes 10% of primary arthroplasties are done because of some childhood hip problem. Well, I would, I would say it's significantly more than that. So if you look at an x-ray carefully, it's actually pretty difficult to find a perfect standard x-ray in a young adult. There's often some minor design flaws, whether it be related to the neck shaft angle, whether it's due to uh, torsional abnormalities, which do occur as a result of either congenital or acquired in childhood, or whether it's a degree of overcovering because of coxa profunda. If you look hard enough, you will find some problem which has probably started in childhood. So um, it's, it's a challenge, and I think it's really important for pediatric uh, orthopedic surgeons to have a, a good experience of adult arthroplasty and I think it's it works very well in terms of discussing cases um, in a multidisciplinary group um, and I think you know the key is collaboration but I think I would agree with the previous speakers in that there is um, an increasing role for custom stems particularly in some of those difficult deformities you've seen as a consequence of the disease and as a consequence of the surgery to try and tide the child by and give them a pain-free childhood and adolescence. Thank you for your time. Any questions? It's not something we actually considered at the time, but I accept that would have been a possibility. Um, I'm not sure whether you can put those bioball adapters on yeah, those stems. The, the maximum correction you can do with a bioball is 10 degrees. So I don't think in this particular case it would have been <coughs> quite as much as you would have wanted. The other thing with a bioball is it gives you a very bulky neck. Sorry. You put the bro you put the brochure. Yeah. And the, and then you put the the actual stem, but it's it's I'm well, not sure where the, how you ended up in a different position from where the Yeah, I'm not sure either. I, I, I felt that the that the the femoral brooch went down um, the canal into the correct position. Uh, but as you can see from the C T analysis it was slightly different from the plan. Um, but it, it seemed to go down to what I felt was the appropriate level of, of, of antiversion, but clearly it wasn't. But I, it wasn't easy to identify that at the time. 